All right, we're gonna look at probability part two, and we're looking at all the odd ones here. So starting with 37, it says that we have a jar that contains five red marbles that are numbered one to five, and eight blue marbles that are numbered one to eight. And so um, really quick word notes, one, two, three, four, five. So those ones are all the red ones. And then we also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And those ones are all blue. So it says that we are going to just draw a marble from random from the jar. So find the probability that the marble is even numbered given that the marble is red. So we have a conditional probability. So we're looking at the probability that we are even given that we already know that we're looking at a red one. So we're focused in on those red numbers. The even ones would be two and four. So that would be two out of the five. For the next one, we want to know um, red, given that the marble is even numbered. So we would write the probability that we are red, given that we are even. So it's a little bit different. We just want to look at all the even numbers. So the even numbers we have total 2, 4, 6, 8 here, and then 2, 4. So there's a total of 6 this time, and the ones that are red are going to be the 2 and the 4. So there's 2 to choose from there. So you can see how the conditional probability, it kind of puts us to a, a smaller sample space compared to the whole entire set. For question 39, we want to compute the probability of flipping a coin and getting heads given that the previous flip was tails. Now, if we're given that the previous flip was tails, it actually doesn't affect us because they're, they're totally independent events. And so it's still going to be um, just one half. So it doesn't, it's, it, there's no conditional probability going on here because given that we knew it was a head, it doesn't actually affect our probability when we flip again to get and getting heads. For question number 41, we want to suppose that a math class contains 25 students and the students in there we have are 14 females, three of them speak French, and then we happen to have 11 males, two of whom speak French. We're going to compute the probability that at a random selected student speaks French given that the student is female. So we already know that the student is female. So then that takes us up to this group. And out of that group, we know three of them are speaking French. So the probability um, that you're gonna be French speaking, given that we know that they are already a female, will be equal to three out of that 14. All right, looking at 43, uh, we own 16 C CDs and we want to randomly arrange five of them in a CD rack. So we have basically five things that we're rearranging. There's a little bit of extra information there because it just wants us to be taking five from there and then seeing the different ways that we could arrange those five. And so it's saying what's the probability that those would end up in alphabetical order. So if we're looking at those five things and how we can order them, that's a permutation. So we have um, 5P5, um, but remember that permutations are really like looking at, and you didn't have to write it that way necessarily. You could say, okay, I have five spots on my shelf. There's five ways to choose the first one, then four, then three, then two, then one, and we multiply that. But really that's the permutation um, 5P5. So we multiply that out we are going to get really 120. And so then being in alphabetical order, that's only one of those ways. So we'll have one out of 120 would be the probability that those five would end up in alphabetical order. For question number 45, we have a lottery game where a player picks six numbers from one to 48. Now, if five of those six numbers match those drawn, they win second. So we wanna know what the probability of winning that second place prize would be. So we want to think about, okay, first off, our sample space is choosing from those 48, six numbers, and the order doesn't matter here, so it's a combination. And then we want to think about, we want five of those six numbers. So we know that we want to see how many ways that we can select, if we, if we know we have the winning numbers um, being six numbers, we want to choose five of those, and then we also need to choose basically that that non-winning number. So there's 42 that comes from 48 minus six ways to get a losing number. And we wanna choose that. 
So I wrote them both as combinations, or you could have just thought about, well, there's 42 numbers left, so there's 42 different ways that I could um, have that. But what this ends up being then is um, 65 is going to be equal to 6, and this 42C1, that's really the 42 that I was saying, and we're going to get 252 over 48C6 is going to be this big number here. Punch it into my calculator. Um, and you can reduce it, but um, it's also fine. Just keep it like that, and that's what we have. And we have one more for part two, question number 47. It says to compute the probability that a five-card poker hand is dealt to you that contains all hearts. Another name for that, if you play poker or you've seen anything, um, it's called a flush. Now it's a particular flush, it's made up of only hearts. So when we're trying to calculate the probability, again, our sample space is all the possible five card hands. So we know that there's 52 cards in a deck and we wanna choose five of them. So see all those rearrangements, which if we punch that into our calculator, uh, we're gonna get this big number. There are a lot of different ways to get five card hands. Looking at 2,598,960. And what is it that we want? We want to get all hearts. Well, there's 13 cards that are hearts and we wanna make sure we're choosing five of those. And so that ends up that there's 1,287 ways for that to happen. And that's our probability.